um, very, very much for such a kind introduction and also for um, allowing me to, to participate in, in this series. I feel very flattered and honored to be part of it um, in a conversation that, uh, you know, I feel my work in conversation with, with some of the other speakers, so it's nice to be here. Also want to thank um, the Center for Globalization and its Cultures and the Department of Comparative Literature, um, and also Christine Rosetta for, for helping um, with all log logistics setting this up. Um, so I, I want to say just before I get started, um, I tried to keep my remarks a little bit, you know, hopefully short today. You know, there's four different vignettes I'm going to present, but um, I just wanted to say preliminarily what I'm going to talk about um, stems from a, a project I'm working on. And the, the first book I wrote, and there's a model of discussing globalization where one understands a sort of global practice that arrives in a particular locality, and then the sort of model of post-colonial scholarship that's the local history of reception. So in my first book, for example, looking at the foundations of the modern university and the modern literary curriculum in colonial Egypt was the method I pursued. For this book I'm working on now, there's a little bit of a twist, which is rather than thinking about a local history of a global phenomenon, I'm interested in a global archive that is an archive of 1,422 films that were shot from across the world and that are currently housed at the Lumiere archive in Lyon, France. And so it's again, this talk you're about to hear today is, essentially, is, is both a reflection on a methodological turn, which is to say, rather than turning to the grounding of a local history, um, it's thinking about the, the, the vision that this particular archive offers for conceptualizing the world. So that sounds very abstract. Hopefully it's gonna get a, a lot less so um, as I step through um, the paper here. So apologies, I'll, I'll shrink myself because I'm gonna share the screen so I can show the slides. So here we go. Um, let's see. There we go, there's that little button. And Daniel, do you mind, is, you can see the image there is, okay, perfect. So the title for, for my remarks today is World Pictures Global Visions. And I'll sort of number the vignettes as I go along. So vignette number one. In the opening paragraphs to the English version of the World Republic of Letters, Pascal Casanova offers us a reading of a detail from Henry James's 1896 story, The Figure in the Carpet. Seeing James's figure, she suggests, is a matter of perspective. If one is prepared to shift one's perspective, to step away from a particular text in order to examine it in relation to other texts, she writes, to try to detect similarities and dissimilarities between them and look for recurring patterns. In short, if one tries to take in the composition of the carpet as a whole, to see it as a coherent design, then it becomes possible to perceive the particularity of the pattern that one wishes to make appear. So expanding further from this observation, Pascal Casanova ultimately suggests that, quote, understanding a work of literature is a matter of changing the vantage point from which one observes it, of looking at the carpet as a whole. And I'll flag here, part of what interests me right in, in this passage from Pascal Casanova is how she shifts us from a hermeneutic problem in, problem of interpretation to really an ocular problem or a perspectival problem that has everything to do with looking. So she adds, the singularity of individual literary works therefore becomes manifest only against the background of the overall structure in which they take their place. Each work that is declared to be literary is a minute part of the immense combination constituted by the literary world as a whole. All right, so what might it mean that a treatise on world literary systems begins with this minute textual detail drawn from a single passage from a short story 
from a single writer, Henry James. From what perspective is the world literary system visible? That is to say, in order to see a world literary system, do we always need to take a step back in order to see the figure at a distance? And you'll soon hopefully understand why these questions intrigue me. For one, they're central to our endeavor as comparatists in a field that often positions us as we like to understand ourselves as between and among multiple national and linguistic traditions. That is, the very gesture of comparative literature would seem to align itself with that effort Casanova describes of taking a step back. And yet Casanova's beginning intrigues me for another reason, which is that Casanova makes the carpet itself visible by casting against the backdrop of her own project. So little would Henry James have known that this masterful critic could weave his carpet into her own work, that through her story, his story, his figure in the carpet would become almost emblematic of 21st century debates in world literature. In spite of all the claims about seeing the big picture then, the figure in the carpet shuttles between the particular detail from Henry James's story and the world literary system that Casanova weaves together in her book. So what I'm about to present today is aimed at this tension between the minute detail, which we often focus on in literary studies, and the global system, which is central to the type of work we do in world, world literature and comparative literature. Where Casanova traces the circulation of literary form, here I'm going to shift optics only slightly, recognizing that Casanova herself makes literature ultimately a question of seeing. For the last few years, I've been exploring an archive of films primarily from 1896 and 1897, commissioned by the French Lumiere Brothers Film Company across the globe. So in this archive of films, what I focus on, um, and I should say these films were understood as animated photographs, but what I focus on is both what they depict at various locations across the world, but also how they make the world itself visible. In the story that follows, I'll be offering reflections drawn from Ottoman Palestine, but I'll be focusing, as you'll see, on a particularly cinematic feat, the close-up. So what follows here is a close-up on a close-up and an exploration of the critical tension between the sites of early film history in this case, the Jaffa Gate in Palestine, and more general reflections on film form, in this case, the close up. Or perhaps even more explicitly, what I'll address here is the detail of a single shot within a carpet of global cinema. So that's uh, vignette number one. Um, and now let me move to the film. This second section is entitled, Looking Close Up. Oh, I just should add that in the context of the book I'm writing, each chapter draws from one of these films from the Lumiere archive, and each of the chapters takes one film from one of the sites that the camera operator I'm about to talk about visited. And then I combine, it's sort of an experimental writing format. So this chapter is on the close up, and therefore I try and focus close up. I have a chapter on framing that's um, a discussion of a film in Algeria that's out of frame, and that's written as a set of frame stories. And I have a chapter on duration in Egypt that's a sort of cinematic depiction of the Great Pyramid, and that chapter is just long and boring. Um, hopefully, I'll <laughs> to perform duration itself. All right, but this first, uh, this second vignette here is called "Looking Close Up." So allow me to begin again, this time with the close up. We grasp here a face on camera captured by the cinematograph in 1897 by the Russian Italian operator, Alexandre Promio, working on behalf of the Lumiere Brothers Film Company. Listed as number 401 in the official catalog, 
This particular film is but one of 1,422 films shot for the company in the 10 years spanning 1895 and 1905 in locations um, ranging from Algiers, Tunis, Cairo, Beirut, and Istanbul to Montreal, Jakarta, St. Petersburg, Budapest, Madrid, and Berlin, and onward and onward and onward. Here specifically, we're at the east entry of the Jaffa Gate in Jerusalem. And this face appears from among many that pass in front of the camera. The technique that the camera operator employs, turning the handle on a cinematograph and doing so on a public street, is thought to have served two functions, both recording the sites and the people of the locations visited, and also promoting the new technology in a sort of public display of the apparatus. So what I'll be describing, Alexandre Promio is one of these camera operators working on behalf of the Lumiere Brothers Film Company. He traveled with the cinematograph, this essentially proto film camera projector across the world. Um, and one of the novelties of the cinematograph is that it both recorded and projected. And so um, again, it would record with the turn cranking of the hand and the recording of the image and then could in turn be projected. All right. So if we look at this film as a historical document, that is to say to look at its forensic dimensions, the film attests to the appearance of the Jaffa Gate a year prior to its alteration to accommodate the arrival of the German Kaiser Wilhelm II, who demanded a breach in the wall for his triumphant entrance into the city. This historical and forensic dimension to this film attests to how the site appeared, what people wore, and ultimately how they walked on that particular day in 1897, that is, before the moat was filled, before the gate itself was removed, and before the adjacent wall was lowered. So one way of looking, in other words, is to look at the sort of mise-en-scene, what's captured in the image. But there's also a formal dimension to these films. And as a formal, as a formal document, the film offers us one of the earliest instances of what we could almost call a close-up. Well, these early films often framed a scene as a kind of tableau. So the camera was still, but people moved within it. And then there was the depth of field where people came, you know, where there was um, dimension. This particular film offers one of the first instances of a face taking up much of the screen. Something that of course becomes much more commonplace in the narrative dimensions of silent film. I begin with this close up to ask what it might mean to take such a minor detail, this face at the Jaffa Gate, as a point of departure for an inquiry into the globalization of film form. Now, forgive me a set of, <laughs> of questions. First, does this close-up on a close-up bespeak some exemplarity for this face, this film, this location, this camera operator, this site? What are the conditions of generalizability for this film? Here's another abstract question. Can there be a global history of film form, which would be capacious enough to think about system and structure that would be equally attentive to the close up and that anti-perspectivalism that it offers, that which extracts and magnifies what could otherwise be seen as a detail? Let me reframe this question, must a global, hist a global film history entail a distant reading of the sort Casanova describes that step back? Or how might it accommodate the particularity of the close-up, which would seem to be the complete opposite of seeing the figure in the carpet because the detail eclipses the possibility of the sort of perspective she describes? What does a close-up reveal? How does it collapse the spatial logic at play in the study of here and there, near and far? How does it collapse the historical logic of then and now? What is the time and place of the close-up without recourse to a distant contextual or serialized reading? So that large swirl of questions is a sort of why this close-up interests me in relation to Casanova. 
So posing these questions, I've already strayed from the image, the film, the face. As you see, part of the magic is that this face offers a particularity beyond the generalizable abstractions of either formalism or historicism. The clothing, the lines on the forehead, the appearance of the eyes. In a word, the look. Importantly, we both look at this face, and as you'll see in a moment, the face looks back at us. Looking at this face entails a reflection not only on seeing, but on general principles of observation. We are here torn between looking at someone on screen and being seen through the camera. The optics of this image puts us beyond a simple matter of seeing the Jaffa Gate. Here in the archive, we're entangled in the poetic encounter of facing the past differently. The look is alive in cinematic form. All right, that's the stakes of why this close-up. Now, this third section is called contextual close-up. And what I want to reckon with is that the close-up always only ever occurs in a series. And so this is an attenuation of this, this serialization that is part and parcel of any close-up. So if I draw attention to a single image, I should add what might likely be obvious. That what I, he what I here call a close-up occurs in a sequence, in a few senses of the term. When Romeo stood on the street with the cinematograph, he effectively produced a film that was itself a sequence of distinct images. As the hand cranked the handle of the cinematograph, a series of photographic images is imprinted on the strip of the interior. The sequence of images when projected offers the illusion of motion, which in turn allows this face to come alive as it does. That is, its very life on screen relies on the critical role that its sequence plays. So that's just like a material history of cinema must recognize that the duration of the close up is itself always constituted of a repeated sequence of images. All right, one advantage of dealing with 40 second films is we can watch the whole thing as I talk over it. So I'll show you the film now. You've seen the close up, the still that I've extracted from it, but here have a look at the film in its entirety. Staring at the scene of pedestrians strolling on the street, we find ourselves with a point of view characteristic of other Lumiere films. The shot frames not only the Jaffa gate in the background, but also the activities of those on the street. Many of these Lumiere films are renowned for having favored the long shot, shooting bodies in full, and for having favored shooting various layers of activity so as to avoid flattened out images. What sets this film apart is the presence of one pedestrian who initially crosses the frame to appear in close up before disappearing off screen in front of our eyes this guy here on the left side of the frame. What's at stake is not solely what is seen, the street, the man's face, the Jaffa gate, but how it's visualized in time with movement and with a distinct sense of the film's frame. Unlike portraiture and painting, a close-up here is only a close-up in the context of a sequence that ensures its duration and this film in particular makes of the face a sort of spectacle that in this 40 second duration, it's the face that becomes the defining characteristic of this particular film. All right, a brief little detour for a second. Film historians often tell the story of the first screening at the Salon Indien in the Grand Café in Paris in December 28th, 1895. In this sort of grand fairy tale of the origins of cinema, an audience gathered in the basement of the cafe to behold a series of 40 second films projected onto the screen. And so the list, the screening list is incredibly well known. Any like film studies 101 class teaches them workers leaving the factory, watering the gardener, feeding the baby, fishing for goldfish, um, and then a disembarkment of um, Congress of Photographers in Lyon. 
the films we see at the Jaffa Gate was projected both in Jerusalem when it was taken and then subsequently on November 1st, 21st in Lyon, France. So it was projected in, in first in Palestine and then back in France, all as part of this broader Lumiere effort to bring the world to the world through a distribution network of early films. So the film testifies to a mode of production that's simultaneously invested in a network of dissemination, but also the sale of the machine on which it was shot. So it's somewhat outside, and this is partially what interests me about the Lumiere films is they don't fit national film history. And most national film historians in North Africa and the Middle East recognize that the Lumiere films were the first films shot in the Middle East, but they're very uncomfortable because they don't, they're not nationally produced films. So they're either described as importations and colonial roots, or they're understood as just, this is where cinema passed through but didn't stay here. And then, you know, normally with the nationalization of the film industry, you get a different sort of story. So it's precisely the messiness of these objects that fascinates me about this archive. So in the general history of film, it's often understood as of early cinemas, like a, the rivalry between the Lumiere Brothers Film Company in France and the kinetoscope of the Edison Film Company in the United States. But part of what I wanna emphasize is the Lumiere Film Company from its inception was already a global endeavor. You had Charles Moisson, Gabriel Vert, Félix Mesquich, Alexandre Cromio, all of whom spanned the globe within the first year of the cinematograph. And in contrast to the kinetoscope, which is what Edison used, um, the cinematograph was portable, so it could record films on site and project films on site. So traces of these global films remain in the archives of, of uh, scientific accounts. So in Egypt, or actually in Egypt and Lebanon, for example, El Moktotov, which is one of the 19th century scientific journals, has a whole account of the cinematograph and how it works. Um, uh, and that appears in Arabic. And then a number of Algerian newspapers, for example, cover the arrival of Alexandre Pomio and describe the cinematograph um, sort of as a news story, as a, as a technological feat. Um, all right, so alongside his visit to Algiers, Tunis, Alexandria, and Cairo, Pomio traveled to Palestine to record sites in Jaffa and Jerusalem. So if here I've traced us sequence as sequence of images that constitute a film, the duration of a film, the sequence of this film in a whole sequence of films shot across the world, then here there's also this film occurs in a sequence of films that was shot in Palestine. So um, it's worth noting that this single film um, was included in the catalog according to the location and time of its film. And so let me just show you, there's number 394 in the Lumiere catalog is arrivé d'un train, so it's, it's the arrival of a train. Then in Jaffa, there's three different films that show a market. So this is Marché 1, Marché 2, Marché 3. <laughs> They're just numbered that way. Number 398 is Débarquement d'une barque, so just getting off a boat. Then there's a panorama that's taken on a, um, on a train. And then, um, let's see, then there's also the, then we arrive at the Jaffa Gate. And it was shot both from the Eastern side, which is what we just watched. There's also a film um, that um, is shot from the Western side. So for some, there we go. And then um, the films follow a sequence that's well known in any account of sort of, painting or photography of the Holy Land. Um, we move from the Saint Sepulchre, the Holy Sepulchre to the Via de la Rosa, the famous trip. And then we have shots of a street. There's the seemingly high Orientalist mode of a caravan of camels. And then 
the final film in the catalog 408 for this Palestine series is the departure from Jerusalem and the camera is mounted on the back of the train and everyone waves goodbye. So, all right, that's within the sequence. If we were to read close up in sequence, this is the kind of anchoring that, that the serialization of it um, that, that, that's being offered. But section four, a whole other way of looking at the film. And that's to say what I'm gonna call a section called facing the close up. So let us then return to our close up. Beyond an index of the Jaffa Gate in 1897, what's remarkable is that this one face emerges directly in front of the camera as though investigating the apparatus itself before crossing the screen and disappearing on the left side of the frame. To focus on its situatedness in the context of other films, the period seems somehow to overlook the formal novelty of this particular film and this one shot of the close-up. So for pioneers of writing on cinema from figures like Jean Epstein to Bella Balash and Sergei Eisenstein, but also for more recent film theorists like Jacques Aumont or Gilles Deleuze, the close-up is an image saturated with affect. It exceeds the parameters of the part-whole relationship and it ultimately actualizes the most affective potentials of film is a medium. And one of the things to think about, like what is especially cinematic about the close-up is if you have filmed theater, the cam in, or you're sitting in a theater, you're always at a set distance from the actors. Whereas part of the novelty of cinema is that you get a whole grammar of faces made possible by um, the fact that you as a spectator in the cinema can be quite close to a face. That's, that's an effect that doesn't exist in the theater, for example. So Marianne Doan summarizes the prevailing understanding by writing about the close-up in the following way. Of all the different types of shots, it's the close-up that's most fully associated with the screen as surface, with the annihilation of a sense of depth and its corresponding rules of perspectival realism. She notes, the image becomes once more an image rather than a threshold onto a world or rather the world is reduced to this face, this object. At the crux of her argument, Doan observes that almost all theorists of the close-up analyze it synchronically, emphasizing its extractability from the film's narrative. And yet in contrast, so this is of course, um, um, Carl Dreyer's The Passion of Joan of Arc, like one of the iconic films that's sort of um, frequently considered in the context of, of close-ups, but against those who see the close-up as extractable from the film or external to it, um, Marianne Doan insists on analyzing it within the context of the narrative and as it's situated in a network of gazes, which are integral to the continuity of space and the overall grammatical intelligibility of the shot. But helpful as Doan's study is, uh, this is also, many of you may know from uh, Roland Barthes' uh, mythologies, his famous discussion of Greta Garbo's um, face at the end of Queen Christina. And so that, you know, again, an iconic description of, of the close-up. So helpful as Don's study is, um, I wonder to what extent the Lumiere film at the Jaffa Gate complicates her reflections a bit. For here, Prior to the emergence of narrative and amidst an almost neo-realist long shot of a street scene, we encounter a gaze at the camera and the appearance of a face in close-up. As a film closely linked to the Jaffa Gate, the close-up takes place in a rather unique manner, both because the adornment of the face we see indexes a location but also, and this is where I wanna place emphasis, also because um, the, the close-up draws our attention to the apparatus through which we look. So let's take a minute looking at how this trot spent, shot transpires reveals a sort of curious effect. So if we look um, 
at the figure on the left, he approaches, then he crosses in front. And then there, crossing back in front of the camera, the pedestrian appears fully in close up, as we see here in the third still. So, of the many aspects to notice in the shot, we're drawn from the close up to its eventual disappearance on the left side of the frame. Far from being a moment of extreme realism, indexing a site in time, the film demonstrates a sort of trick of the eye, keeping the Jaffa Gate steady in the background while effectively erasing the onlooker in the movement off screen and ultimately drawing our attention to the activity of filming and being filmed. The close-up, in other words, frames the operations of both production and disappearance, refracted as it is through a rare moment tangled in the network of gazes. In a certain sense, we could say that the close-up serves to block the view, to obscure what is seen, and to reflect on the conditions of the camera itself. That is, what we see on screen is likely a result of the camera operator being accosted by this onlooker. But what is made visible in the end is the novelty of a medium capable of the close-up in its eventual passage to off-screen space. So it's been noted that looks at the camera are not entirely uncommon. Even the departure from the train station that we saw moments ago involves extensive looks and even waves at the camera. Here though, the look functions not as an eyeline match in a narrative world, but it draws our attention to the process of filming. So in this heavily mediated site, we're led to consider the dynamics of a close-up, possibly the first close-up, as a sort of fold within the scene of filming. Anachronistic as it would be to say so, the close-up in this instance is an almost Brechtian moment in a sort of Godardian cinematic trick, drawing attention less to what the camera sees than to making the camera itself visible. Yet another face from yet another film from Ottoman Palestine. As a figure proceeds along the street, the face is obscured by a hand, attempting to avert the gaze of the camera and refusing the reciprocal look that were offered in the film at the Jaffa Gate. It might be tempting to see in this gesture a sort of subversion or resistance to the observational camera. And yet, this moment recalls Roland Barthes' reading of Dwayne Michael's portrait of Andy Warhol in Camera Lucida, where Roland Barthes writes, one of my favorite lines from this book, quote, I have no desire to comment intellectually on this game of hide and seek, since for me, Warhol hides nothing. He offers his hands to read quite openly. Other hands appear quite prominently in Haron Farouki's discussion of Marc Garanger's photographs of Algerian women in Bilde der Welt und Inschrift des Krieges, as the voiceover tells us, I, I, this is actually Kaja Silverman who voices over this film, the veil covers the mouth, nose, and cheeks and leaves the eyes free. The eyes must be accustomed to meet a strange gaze the mouth cannot be accustomed to being looked at. And just as this voiceover delivers these words, Faroki's hands covers aspects of Garanger's photos, recropping the faces that have been stripped for the gaze of the police camera and identity cards. Alongside these tactics for avoiding the camera, what makes the Jaffa Gate film exceptional and stand in contrast to these faces hiding and revealing is that here on the street in 1897, the observed interrupts its filming and effectively blocks the scene, flipping the script, looking at the camera, and over 100 years later, looking at us, looking at him. And as I've suggested here, the film's close-up offers less a 
contemplative moment of photogenie in the sense we see with the face of Garbo at the end of Queen Christina, then an interruption, the disappearance of the scene and the appearance of the act of filming. It may remain part of the optical unconscious of film studies, but it's by no means canonically situated with any particular national cinema. And the close-up may no longer interrupt the act of filming or disappear the subject being filmed off screen, but it remains integral to the formal dimensions of viewing the world through the camera and the aesthetic possibilities implicit in facing the camera differently. Okay, I'll move to my very last section now. And if we began with Pascal Casanova and the step back and the figure in the carpet, then we've moved to the close up and looking at that face at Jaffa Gate. We've considered sequence in the sense of how that film is sequentially included in a history of cinema. And then we've just sort of meditated a little bit on the close up and the way that it, the close up frames the look for us. I now have this last section, which was titled before Zoom became a thing, but it's called Zoom Out Facing the World. If I began with Casanova's reflections on perspective and followed with a close up on the face of the Jaffa Gate, then allow me in closing here to zoom out. Like Pascal Casanova, Homei King begins virtual memory with a detail of global proportions. Taking a cue from Hannah Arendt's remarks on the Sputnik, Homei King arrests her attention on the famous image known as the blue marble. This is Homei King. The image showed the earth as a nearly perfect round disc in color surrounded by a black void. The planet was now visible from its good side, its face evenly illuminated, vivacious circle beautifully centered in frame. Earth had finally appeared in the form that would earn it the nickname, the blue marble, as it was affectionately called in captions of similar pictures taken from space. So in seeming contrast to the close-up, the blue marble allows for the visual apprehension of the planet from afar. The perspective it offers would seem to make possible an understanding of the figure in the carpet, and yet, King adeptly reads this image as revealing a contradictory set of options. On the one hand, she writes, if we identify with the small world represented by the blue dot, the image might invite the kind of caretaking attitude that Brand and his cohort espoused. On the other hand, if we identify with the eye of the camera and the perspectival point from which the image was taken, we find ourselves at a great distance from the planet, exiled and painfully alone, perhaps, or alternatively larger than life, a deity who could crush the little planet with just a thumb and forefinger. What I admire in Homé King's reading, in her opening up of the possibilities of apprehending the world, is her recognition that, quote, the spatial distance becomes a metaphor for disconnection and indifference. What, admi what I admire is that here, distance is not necessarily figured as the capacity to see, command, and understand the figure in the carpet, but as a potential place of exile, alienated, abstracted, and apart. And I just put a little emphasis here. If in Pascal Casanova, the step back, the capacity to apprehend the system is a condition for understanding a world system. Then what, I'm, what I like about Homé King's gesture is she puts an ethical valence to the step back to say that it's a position of alienation and vulnerability. And so we get in these sort of bookends to this talk that I'm giving today, two different ways for thinking about the ethics of global apprehension or what it is to apprehend a global system. So at a moment when our field turns to world literary systems, global media, or the conditions of planetarity, I value the ethical valences that Homé King helps to illuminate, in which mediation 
is inseparable from the vision of the world itself. Whether through the figure in the carpet or the blue marble, we encounter the conundrum of how best to apprehend the world and remain apart. And yet looking at the close up from the Lumiere film challenges us not only to look, but to be looked at, not only to see, but to be made aware of the apparatus of seeing. In this way, proximity to the camera at once forecloses the broader figure in the carpet and yet reveals as though through a mirror, the apparatus through which we see. Inadvertent though it may have been, Casanova's move from the sayable to the seeable and from discovery to perspective reveals the world anew, allowing us to understand that in the world system, the detail matters. And so to here, facing the look of this Lumiere film at the Jaffa Gate, do we encounter a world picture of a distinctly global cinematic vision? So thank you for, for your attention to the Zoom screen and yet another Zoom event and for your patience as I waded my way through the talk. Uh, thank you so very much. I, uh, I have plenty of questions, but uh, I'm sure that people in the audience have better and more interesting questions. So um, I'll, I'll begin, but if you have questions, please feel free to either um, chat them in the box uh, and I can read them uh, aloud, or if you want to kind of raise your hand or let me know uh, that you would like to turn your mic on, that's also an option. Um, I guess I'll start with the most obvious comp litty question uh, ever, which is uh, that, uh, I mean, a, a similar analogy might be made uh, uh, to Eric Auerbach, uh, who sees um, who sees all of Western literature uh, in its minute detail from exile, or, or so the kind of drama of his Istanbul uh, sojourn goes. Right, so it's he is both he is both able to pick out this kind of minute detail, this close up in uh, Virginia Woolf's um, to the lighthouse. But that's only possible precisely because he can see Europe from from exile, um, uh, and so I guess I mean, as one kind of as you shift from thinking about world literature to world cinema, if that's actually a, a shift uh, that is uh, worth noting, I mean, how do you how do, uh, are you making a kind of similar kind of trying to kind of think these scales alongside each other in a in in that in that trajectory of of comparative comparativism philology uh, um, or, or, or is just the, the opening scene of Pascal Cousin that was just so beautifully written that it's worth holding on to? No, it's a, it's a beautiful question, Daniel. And, and actually like of the, of the iterations of this talk, I've, you know, I've actually never had anyone connect it back to our box mimesis as a point to think through. No, in a good way. <laughs> and, I, and I think, you know, there's a way that the, the cliche of reading in detail whether it's Auerbach's attention to Odysseus's scar or whether it's his attention to the brown stocking, um, you know, that all of these for him are instances of what he indexes as the story of realism in the West. And I think, and, and, and I like how, again, how you connect Auerbach's philological vision to his exile in Istanbul and that that provides him a particular optic on this canon of Western literature from which mimesis derives. I'd say the difference here is, is twofold. Um, one, when we think about Auerbach's exile, there's the sort of, there's an embodiment of that exile that is almost biographical. And that that's, that's the linchpin upon which we, un, you know, one understands mimesis in world literature, that it relies on the displacement of the genius author who recalls from memory these texts and spins this, you know, masterful critical piece. Um, the story of realism that stems then linking everything from, you know, Homer to the Bible to Virginia Woolf is different in the Lumiere archive for, for a couple of reasons. One, notions of authorship are, are not functional. This is a machine that travels the world. 
And so I, I think sort of the humanist valence of exile that we see in Auerbach's work is a very humanistic gesture to say, you know, to think about an archive as something that lives in the author's mind. And I think the technological vision of the camera that travels the world unveils a very different understanding of what globalization can mean. The camera is never exiled and the machine is not exiled. And the faces we see through the camera are neither the provenance of the person whose face it is nor the celluloid on which they're printed. And so what I love about photography and cinema is that it unveils for us a very different valence to realism than our box vision of realism in the Western novel. And I think one of the ways that I wanna put pressure on conventional understandings of colonialism and photography is not to graft realism as that which we see through the camera, that the realism is in the adherence of the image to some fantasy of the real, but actually to think about the structural relationship the camera has to an epistemology of seeing the world at the end of the 19th century. That's super abstract, but there's ways that it becomes very concrete. And I think one of the things that I would say for media studies scholars is it's a short circuit to say that the camera is a machine. I'm fascinated by the fact that William Henry Fox Talbot, who like one of the early experimenters in photography, um, often seen uh, you know, is you know, in the history of photography as a sort of an, a necessary you know, nodal point in that narrative, was also a philologist. And his fantasy for the camera was not to picture the world, it was to picture scripts. And there was a way that, you know, we have the discourse of the camera traveling to take pictures of, you know, elsewheres, but actually his camera and his printing practices were turned towards a fantasy of reproducing scripts and disseminating them across. So that would just be one of the ways that I would say a discourse of Orientalism is not what's seen through the camera, but if we wanna tell a history of technology with Orientalism, it means reckoning with the very uncomfortable history that the camera itself as technology emerges from an epistemological form known as Orientalism that's not as simple as saying pictures taken in Egypt are Orientalist and pictures taken in London aren't because that philological practice is as much a part of those images shot in London and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that said, it's cool. I've never had anyone ask about Auerbach, but that would be, you know, if I were to sort of think alongside your question, that would be one of the ways I would index the distinction between realism and the literary project of the exiled writer versus the type of um, um, media history that the camera and you know, um, representational practices offer with the Lumiere archive. Thank you. I, I, I'm also uh, zooming in from Basel uh, and uh, a, a coincidence of uh, 1897 is that the first uh, Zionist conference uh, occurred in Basel uh, in 1897, the same year that this film was, uh, uh, was released uh, about Palestine. And uh, uh, and in Ariel Azoulay, a kind of beautiful thinker of film and photography, um, you know, is, is someone who you know, has claimed multiple times in many different ways that the kind of the, the close up or the look back at the camera, uh, especially in the context of either um, um, U.S. black slavery or or Palestine, is is a is a kind of slight form of protest uh, to say that we are here, we are humans. Um, um, and I, I, it's it, it's certainly um, a historical to kind of connect um, the 1897 Zionist movement with the with the post World War II Zionist movement, but um, nevertheless, there does seem to be a kind of demand for uh, a kind of recognition might be too strong of a word, but uh, kind of uh, facing the camera and demanding to be at least accounted for um, or to move out of the way. Um, uh, by this close-up, I was wondering if you had, kind of, if if the site of if the site matters uh, in this context. Yeah. I I love it, and and I you know, Zulai's work 
you know, Nick Merzoff and Aria Azulay are kind of at the backdrop of some of the ways that I've been, you know, that, that they've helped to form my thinking about um, imperialism and optics and visuality and coloniality. Um, I'd say that the, the only caveat I would provide here to Azulay's argument is, um, and it, it's the reason I'm actually quite fascinated by this moment in film history, is that the camera, the cinematograph was a novelty. It was unknown. And so as that camera is on the street, it's unknown what image results because that image had yet to be seen. You could say that, you know, someone sketching on the street offered or a camera, maybe someone seen a photograph, but in terms of even the vocabulary, and this is the anachronism of my talk is essentially that the close up, it, it, there's no such thing as a close up at this moment. And so the animated photograph was novel, not only for what it depicted, but for how it depicted it. So one could say that the look at the apparatus around which the latter part of my talk revolved derives not from stop filming me or don't look at me, but actually derives more from a look of wonder or curiosity or merely an interruption. Like, dude, why are you staying on the street with this wooden box? You know, and that, that um, unfortunately, disrupts a grammar for anti-colonial practices that becomes legible later, but, and I don't think is illegible at this moment, but I don't know that it grafts into the sort of story that even you'll get in the 19, by 1908 and onward, where the Edison company and the Pathé company, and they've all sent films to Egypt by that point. And already you have a very different discourse. At this moment, it really is like a scientific exhibition of here, look at the iPad, look at this device. And so the, the archive itself is an anachronism because any of these camera operators didn't know that the films they were shooting would be at all consequential. And so it was when they started, you know, so the, the archive is a back formation that emerges because the history of cinema deems these the first films, but they were disposable. They were not seen as objects that were sacred or worth venerating. I, I have more questions, but I, 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 uh, I, I'll keep going until someone uh, jumps in. Um, uh, oh, actually, I, I, I will uh, go ahead and read Gina's question uh, aloud. Um, could you say more about the difference between the photographic portrait and a close up, uh, following up on this question? I, also, I noticed others looking at the camera in the shot, but I do agree that this particular image with a close up as an interruption fun functions differently. Yes, I mean, there does seem to be a, a number of people who realize that the uh, the object is there, uh, but it's this man who, who comes closest to it that is really engaging with it. So, how do you see that difference? Yeah, no, it's great. And, and, you know, Gina, thank you for the question, Daniel. Thank you for elaborating it. Um, I love um, Istifan Shihai's book, Arab Imago, and Ali Bedad's recent book, Camera Orientalis. Both track a history of photography in the Middle East in fascinating ways. Uh, um, an artist designer, Garam Jagalian, just has an exhibition right now going on in Cairo on early photography in Bethlehem based on um, his grandfather's um, studio. Uh, and I, I, you know, I think th there's a long and important history to portrait photography in the Middle East. Often Armenian communities, Greek communities, Arab communities that would have these studios. And um, if I'm understanding in, in Gina's question, something quite important, which is that in portrait photography, the face matters. In fact, the face is deeply consequential and you have a framing of the face that's integral to studio photography. So then how does this film differ? And I think if I were to delimit the epistemology of the cap de visite photograph, or even the studio photograph versus the camera, then I would say more than an aesthetic text, this early Lumiere film is almost the effect of a security camera or an observational camera that it, it's haphazard. It's, it's intentional about the placement of the camera on the street, 
which is to say the gate in the background and people walking up the street, but it's entirely left to chance and surprise and the haphazard nature of that sort of interruption that makes the close-up itself a sort of accident. And so even for all of the camera operators, they were each given a, a rubric for how they were supposed to photograph or to, to position the camera. So one of the challenges, many people write about these films and I think in important ways, connect them to the, the sort of insidious colonial gaze that objectifies the other and you know, sort of fits within a long history of anthropology and photography. To a certain extent, that's true and that's a given. But I, I watched you know, hours and hours and hours of these films in the archive. And what's fascinating is that yes, you have camels in Palestine, but you also have camels in Hungary because there's an almost algorithmic globalism so if you remember in the Palestine sequence, you have the train, the disembarking from the boat, you have animals and you have street scenes. Those are four different types of shots that whether you're in Tunis, Egypt, Hungary, Germany, Montreal, or they're all the same because they were seen by the Lumiere company to be the most interesting sites to visit. And so it's infrastructure, animals and streets all of which lend you an element of surprise that you don't necessarily get in a studio photograph. And that you also don't get in the Edison company, the sort of black box style of filming where everything that transpires is placed intentionally in front of the camera. So part of the novelty of the cinematograph is that it functions like an observational witnessing or a video camera more than it does the studio based um, film system. Sorry, a very long-winded response, but um, you know the question hits on some of those important axes. And just a, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, similarly, uh, 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 Gina writes uh, in France, uh, they love trains coming into the station as well as people put departing places such as factories. And that does seem like a, uh, I, 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 I love this phrase algorithm. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say it's spot on. There's the, the famous arrival of the train at Les Ciotat, but there's also a train in Algiers. There's a train in Alexandria. There's a train in Jerusalem. There's a train in Istanbul. And so in the catalog, um, the algorithmic part is that, you know, one arrives to these cities by trains and therefore that's often the main spot. And then I've, I've traveled over the years because I've been working on this project absurdly long time. It's just been gestating. But in Tunis and in Cairo and in Beirut, like I visited the sites where all of these films are shot and all of the street scenes are, are in close proximity to the train station. Like it's just, it's, it's you know, it's like a very easy connection to draw because you see where he gets off with the camera and then goes a couple of blocks away and then a couple of blocks after that and just sets it up and then heads on to the next stop. But sorry, I interrupted you, Daniel. No, no, I, 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 I really love the phrase algorithmic globalism, uh, and I, I don't want to put a too fine of I mean, a point on this, uh, but I am, I'm kind of uh, I, the the way that you've talked about uh, the kind of training of camera operators by the Lumiere brothers is um, maybe this is not fair to either one of your projects uh, is similar to uh, the way you kind of redefine reading. In the context of world literature. So there's a certain type of kind of pedag social pedagogy, um, both of filmmaking and of reading, of, of viewing, um, viewing a cityscape or something like that, and of reading. Um, uh, I mean, it, do you think what's being kind of thought through here, at least in some kind of early iteration, some kind of tentative iteration, might be a kind of, sort of, kind of similar, sort of, so, similar sort of, sort of social pedagogy, a uh, 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 kind of practice of cultures of seeing uh, that's being kind of in its early phases thought through? Or... I wish, I mean, it, it's interesting, you know, I, much as I love the scholarship on reading, which is obsessed with pedagogical formations of ways to read properly, and that, you know, the relationship between world literature and institutions that train readers is inseparable. Um, I, there's a, the, the link between a visual pedagogy 
and this moment in early cinema is, is much messier in different ways. Um, Elizabeth Thompson has amazing work on early cinemas in Syria and the sort of disciplining of spectators in Syria. There's a famous passage from Hamid Nafasi describing spectatorship in Iran, but um, the question of spectatorship for these early films is a little bit messier uh, to the extent that um, you know many of them played in courts, like um, among bankers or among um, you know princely classes, and so it yeah. The, I will say just as a footnote to your question, I think subsequently there's incredible work of artists in the Middle East and across the world who are working with this archive. Um, so there's a Syrian collective that does amazing work on witnessing and observation and draws from some of these early Lumiere films. There's an artist in Beirut out of the um, Arab Image Foundation who has been working with some of these early films as well. And to me, they give the possibility of a sort of poetic afterlife, but for the flashback um, to 1897, you know, unless, I mean, one of the ways to, to respond to your question would be, of course, to read the close up and the interruption as a mode of undisciplined behavior in front of a camera. Um, but even there would be a certain, you know, I'd have to think through that more, but it would be one possibility for thinking about it. I, I have another question. I, 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 I will keep asking questions. Uh, no, I, I love it. It is, it is a fantastic talk and, I, I, and to, it brought up a number of very, very disparate questions. But um, I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm thinking of a different moment, uh, admittedly a very different moment in um, film history, uh, which is uh, kind of 19 teens, 1920s British India. Um, uh, and which which was which featured a major debate between Indian bureaucrats, um, Hollywood producers, um, Indian filmmakers, um, specifically about the close up. Uh, and the 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 concern there was that um, uh, it was largely a kind of British bureaucrat concern. Um, uh, was that the close up was a bit too democratic for a, a, a an empire with caste. And an empire with race, and so um, the close-up was actually a threat to the British Raj in some ways, um, which then the British Raj displaced on to uh, being a threat against uh, Brahmins or uh, or Muslim women. I mean, it was always something. It was there was always an alibi for uh, um, you know, for not wanting a close-up, um, but it, it was it was so there was this kind of five-year-long debate which produced a two hundred-page report about mostly about either in kind of domestic scenes or close-ups, um, which was about the, the, there was just too much intimacy in it, even when it was accidental. So even in these street scenes that were filmed in Bombay by Indian filmmakers, if someone wandered too close to the camera and took up too much of the space, um, you could not be so sure that that person was Dalit uh, 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 or uh, that that person was white and the viewer was not uh, uh, or, or any of these kind of anxieties that, like you know, that the British Raj loved to live on. Um, and so, uh, I mean, without kind of I mean, this, this is not this is a completely earlier moment and a completely different time kind of context. But nevertheless, there does, I mean, it begins a kind of conversation about the kind of the alleged dangers of the close up of 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 the uh, and of the medium of film itself. Um, especially in a kind of colonial context. Uh, I wonder if you have anything to say. Yeah, yeah no, that's that's fascinating, Daniel. And I I, I didn't know about the um, you know I would I'd be curious to follow you know to follow up on on those references you're you're making. The um, in terms of reflections on the close up, I mean, most of the writing around these films are either technological accounts that occur in the, like El Mokpatov has, or the newspapers have. Um, and even there, the, the, the sort of textual dimension of a film is never mentioned. That it's always, which is interesting, of course, because that what the 
articles are making visible is how the machine works. What the machine itself is making visible is a phenomenon of a trick of the eye that's then a wonder, but it's as much a technological wonder as it is any sort of ethnographic wonder. To the extent that I almost, I mean, the wonder is as much technological as it might be um, ethnographic. The, there's um, the other archive for sources on, on these films. Um, Promio has a carnet de voyage, so he kept notes during his travels. Felix Mesquich published a book based on his work as a camera operator. And Gabriel Ver, who, who left, had published um, a book about his time as a Lumiere operator. So some of that gives some light, some sort of sheds light on this moment. But I think the type of discourse on cinema that emerges already in the 1910s and onward um, does not exist at this particular moment, even though people in the tens and onward will reflect back to this moment, which is essentially what we're getting in each of these books. Um, it's always, you know, like the archive itself is always a kind of um, back formation. Uh, uh, Gina has another question, which I'll read. Uh, uh, I think it also may good, uh, it may be good, as she says, uh, too, to compare this close-up image to uh, Lumiere's early film portraits. So thinking of the medium three shot of Baby's Breakfast, but also scenes focusing on specific uh, people in Promio's films. Um, I, I cannot elaborate on that. I, I am not. No, this uh, is a great question. I, I love it. I mean, and, and Gina's absolutely right. So, you know, there's the very first films that Louis Lumière shot, and they're all taken at the villa at Montplaisir. And they're the novel, you know, the cinematograph would be on the back porch of the house. So, Feeding the Baby was shot at the villa and was a very intimate portrait of the family. And so, um, I think if I'm understanding in the question, the intimacy is that the, the camera functions almost as a mirror for a domestic space that the Lumiere family has. And sort of where one chapter of the book looks at the distinction between windows and mirrors in cinema. And so do these portraits of, and the, the, what I use, so is workers leaving the, fa the factory, which catalogs the workers from the Lumiere factory who look at themselves in that film when it's rescreened as though in a as in a um, as though in a mirror, or the disembarkment of the Congress of Photography, which was filmed as people got off the boat in Lyon to go to the Congress of Photography. The Lumiere brothers filmed them and then showed that film at the Congress of Photography, so it functioned like a mirror. So then the question is when these non-mirrored faces come back to Lyon, like the face we saw from the Jaffa Gate, then it, it shifts a bit. It's no longer cinema as a mirror, but cinema as a window. And that aesthetic distinction, when looking at oneself through the camera, the sort of Vito Acconci style of the narcissism of the spectator versus the camera as a window onto the world, I think actually is a site that it's important to consider um, you know, and, and I think Gina's question here hits the nail on the head. In portrait photography, you're mirroring back. Or in these intimate early domestic spaces, you're mirroring back. And that's really not the case. I mean, these, the films shot in the Middle East were shown in the Middle East, but I, my sense is like that guy on the street was not part of the audience that would subsequently see it. Um. I will ask another com a completely random question because I just ran a, a kind of a Daniel's esoteric question uh, column alongside the, the the otherwise very coherent lecture. So I, I apologize that I'm uh, doing this, but I, I'm, I'm, I would like to hear you say more about uh, duration. I, mean, I think uh, uh, and this is uh, the, I mean, this is a moment where um, uh, at least especially within the French context, uh, uh, a number of uh, vitalist philosophers are thinking about duration. Uh, Henri Bergson is thinking about duration, um, and and there does seem to be a kind of dis I mean, as you pointed out, a kind of a major difference between thinking of film as duration uh, at this moment than thinking of film as separate um, uh, images that happen to flow together. Um, so, I mean, could you say a bit more about how you theorize it, how you're thinking about duration, and then kind of how this kind of 
freeze frame close up that's within that kind of broader uh, bulk of thought at that moment. Yeah, I, awesome. Um, so I, if I might bring you to the scene of the chapter on duration. So many of you have in your head already the iconic image of the three pyramids in Giza. So imagine what you can already imagine, which is a Lumiere film where the camera's positioned with those three pyramids in the background, running for 40 seconds. And at one point, a camel, uh, you know, a Bedouin riding a camel crosses the frame. So every spectator across the world knows the iconic pyramids. So seeing the pyramids, whatever. But the pyramids index mythological time. They, they index the mythological proportions of ancient Egypt. And yet, for all the photographs, paintings, lithographs of the pyramids, here in the Lumiere film, you don't just see the pyramids, you see the duration of the pyramids for 40 seconds in 1897. So you have the most vernacular time, the duration of that image brought to bear against the backdrop of the most mythological understanding of time. So that's scene one. Scene two is André Bazin, the you know, famous editor of Cahiers du Cinéma, when he reflects on cinema and duration, all of you remember the ontology of the photographic image, all of his metaphors derive from ancient Egypt and its mummification. And so mummification is what film does. It mummifies a moment in time, like a fly trapped in amber, like a snowflake. That all of, you know, and so part of my interest there is that not only do we have the collision between vernacular time of cinema and the mythological time of the pyramids, but then the very conceptual formation for thinking about duration in film theory essentially brings us back to that site. I could add a third, which is Alfred North Whitehead in his theory of the event uses the pyramids. So what if we think about film not as a historical moment, but in the theorization that Whitehead offers of the event? What would it mean to refract Whitehead's theory of the event through the technological promise or the technological material dimensions of temporality that we get in the film. Those are the three scenes of the chapter. So just to give you a sense of where I go at duration in that bit, but it, it refracts that mythological time through these different uh, frameworks. That's, that's amazing. Uh, um, uh, I think Gina has asked another question, but she's asked it uh, in direct message. So I will read it aloud. Um, uh, does the image of the unruly man uh, disrupt a construction of the imperial visual unconscious coming into being. Um, uh, 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 that over to you. Yeah, um, it's a great. I mean, it's a it's a good question. I you know, in terms of an imperial unconscious, the fact that these. So I think of the. Basically, there's a scene from when I think of an imperial unconscious, I think of a film like um, Pepe Le Moco, where it's classic in French cinema, but you have an imagination of the colonial city from above, and it's a map of the city, so that everything is visually apprehendable from on high. And then when the camera goes to the street level, it's the classic colonial trope of chaos and unmappability and unknowability of the caspa. And I think in the Lumiere films, like one of the things that's fascinating about the algorithmic globalization they offer is that that script doesn't work really. I mean, it's train stations and street scenes, but the street scenes, again, are, they, they don't have the same, they're more, this is the most iconic site in visual culture Everyone's seen this, but here we're now seeing it on cinema. We're seeing it on the cinematograph and we see people coming up and down the street. So I don't know, much as I would like to make a claim that these are disrupting, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, it's a little bit harder. Um, I see Gina's added a question about Sergei Eisenstein and, oh, I, I'll, since she just added the Battle of Algiers, <laughs> I'll mention that Pepe Lamoco's opening scene that I just mentioned is 
echoed in many of the scenes in Battle of Algiers, which plays off of that trope of, um, you know, the colonial mapping project versus the, um, you know, the threshold between the new city and the old city as it plays out in Battle of Algiers plays off that stereotype. For Eisenstein and the hieroglyph, um, yeah, that, so Eisenstein is, is probably one of my nearest and dear, like I, I adore his work. Um, I know him, so Vasha Lindsay, who's writing about this a few years before Eisenstein, does draw a connection between film and hieroglyphs. Eisenstein draws a connection um, less to hieroglyphs than to, um, uh, actually, I mean, in this messy illusion, but he draws to the, um, the ideogram. And so it, you know, it's his argument. So I have more to say on that in terms of philology and orientalism and the conceptualization of visuality, but that's, <laughs> that's all in an, uh, an article I have called Picturing Other Languages, which goes down that rabbit hole a little bit. Um, but I, yeah, I, I glimpsed a little bit with the William Henry Fox Talbot bit, but I, it's, uh, so I, I won't go on forever and ever on that answer. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about. I mean, there's there's also another another I guess I guess another way of um, uh, of thinking this early moment in opposition to kind of colonial uh, kind of imperial gaze um, is precisely how you put it in conversation with the Algerian woman unveiled uh, and, and kind of drawing both on Fanon's account and also on, uh, on that filmic image, but. Uh, um, it, it, of of the various things that Benjamin said about film, um, one of the kind of more obscure things that I absolutely uh, love uh, is in an essay on elective affinities, uh, where the 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 camera um, is not in fact to penetrate, uh, it's not to it's not to uh, induce a gaze, but in fact to kind of stand in awe, uh, and and kind of let wash over. I mean, it's, it's something kind of reminiscent of the arcades project, I suppose. But um, and, and so. Uh, and there's there's these kind of two models of of, of filming uh, one which Benjamin offers as the kind of like uh, let let the cityscape wash over you it's non penetrative it's non imperial uh, and then and which then I mean, moves and 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 quite quickly uh, by the teens and twenties then to become uh, an object of imperial control and gaze and uh, and vision so you know, seen from above unveiling and all of these other kind of violent acts. Uh, of, of of state surveillance. Uh, so I mean, um, I mean, not not to put too fine a point on it, but the 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 uh, the the role that Benjamin attributes to this earlier moment is one of uh, of philology, whereas uh, uh, to the 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 latter is one of, of philosophy and analysis. So so a kind of robust defense of 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 attention uh, and, and, and to the cityscape as it is without seeking to kind of penetrate it or to know it or to survey it. Um, that was, yeah, sorry, I that mean, was not a question. I should, I should, no, 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 it's great. I, I mean, should be able to pretend the, like it was one. <laughs> one of the things about this moment in cinema, you know, it's, it's what Tom Gunning would classically call the cinema of attractions. So it's prior to narrative cinema. Um, by the time we reach Benjamin and Eisenstein and Vasha Lindsay and all of these, um, Bella Balash, all of these writers on film, the magic there is essentially the possibility of the cut. That is to say, there's part of where montage theory can happen is through a whole understanding of uh, a cinematic grammar or a language of cinema. And so even though it's not the sort of Christian Metz version we'll get later, there is a way that Eisenstein's immediate philological interest is with the language of cinema. And Benjamin, even, you know, if you remember in the work of art of the age of mechanical reproduction, the distinction he draws between the magician and the surgeon. And the surgeon cuts in and that that's the possibility of cinema, whereas the magician is laying on of hands and that sort of thing. I, one could say that the close-up classically fits the typology of the standing in awe, um, meaning the face of Garbo is the moment of spectacle and arrest. Um, 
again, why I think what we're dealing with in the early Lumiere films is more the surveillance camera or the observation is because its aesthetic mode has more in common with surveillance than it does with um, artistry in that sense of deliberate cut and editing. The flip side of that though, is I don't know that it's a mode of surveillance that's akin to state surveillance of see from above and let's look and map the territory. Um, if there's an algorithmic orientalism or, or sorry, algorithmic globalization, mm -hmm. it's for the camera operators, but the way these are cataloged is just the order in which they were taken. And there's no key to the Lumiere catalog. There is now that um, Michel Aubert and a number of scholars in France have sort of put it together so you can look, um, you know, and, and it's broken down by ter territory and time period and all of that. But at the end of the day, it's a collection that doesn't have the same key that it, that it might have had at one point. Um, I will, I, I, I'll let Gina have the last question. and. Um... Uh, and uh, she asks, isn't it more like Krakow's faith in, faith in the long take, which is why he uh, admired the Lumiere brothers so much? Um, yeah, no, that's great. I mean, so one of the classic divisions in film or the, you know, the directors who assemble reality for you and guide the eye through a set of cuts. So the capacity of film to produce reality or construct it through a set of images versus directors who reveal reality to you, who just show you rather than assemble for you. So on the one side is the early Eisenstein of a film with many cuts that assembles different images that construct the world. On the other hand is a director um, like Rossellini or Flaherty, who just, you know, in the principle of these film theorists, show you have a faith in the image. And the Lumiere brothers, if, if one reads retroactively, would seem to be on the side of a long take where the camera sits there and you apprehend the world at this moment and it's not heavily interrupted. Um, what um, Dina here is just calling the spiritual power of observation. And I think there, there is that element. Um, and yet there is also, I mean, the roots they're traveling are so overdetermined. They're, they're classic colonial roots. And so it's hard, it's, I'm not trying to have it both ways, but I am saying that we'll, in to analyze this archive means being attentive to the anachronism of the archive itself. Film didn't exist at the time. It's being attentive to the fact that film is transmedial because it's, um, only ever its photography and its painting and its lithography, but it the, the logic of cinema doesn't yet exist. Um, and then it's both colonial and not. And so I think, you know, um, I like Fatima Roni's work on the third eye and this sort of colonialism in cinema. I like Ariel Azulay's work, Nick Mirzoff's work. Yes, it's part of the project, but I think I'd say if I want to end on one point, it's to say, Part of the contradiction that this project sustains for me is um, comes down to an image that exists outside the Lumiere Brothers villa from um, uh, 1997. So we're celebrating the centenary of cinema. And they have an image where they restaged workers leaving the factory with a set of global directors walking out arm in arm to test as a sort of testament to the global empire of cinema. So you have Yusuf Shaheen, you have Salzburg, you have all of these directors walking out. So for me, if there's a contradiction, it's how do we reckon the multicultural logic of the late 20th century celebration of globalization in cinema, where workers have been substituted for iconic global directors with the colonial labor of the 19th century. And I think, I guess if for me, there's an importance to the Lumiere archive, it's that it indexes an archeology span of universalism. Universalism on the sense of it forces us to reckon with the distinction between colonialism 
in neoliberalism. It forces us to reckon with a distinction between archive and empire. And it forces us to reckon with the fact that the Lumiere Brothers Company was not a national project, it was a capitalist project. And that the entire, um, you know, it, those are the contradictions. That's the fabric, that's the engine. It's also um, what makes the Lumiere Brothers neither entirely good nor entirely bad, but it does at least rehearse for us, a, it offers us a different analytical frame from how it comes to celebrate itself with that iconic image of these global directors. And so those are some of the, you know, in terms of a sort of frontispiece to the work, it's that scene of how do we understand globalization substituting for labor on the centennial celebration of cinema um, that my, you know, the, the project and the questions I've been thinking through are really trying to thread those 19th and 20th century understandings of universalism back together. And why I think for me as a comparatist, this site hits at all the orthodoxies of Complet. Like Complet is about particularity of language, place, and national history. In this archive, it, it's messy. It's messy in all the ways that made it a very intriguing and continue to make it a very generative site for me as someone interested in Complet. Good. That thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for uh, an excellent talk. Thank you for humoring my uh, uh, scattered questions. Uh, uh, thank you very very much uh, for sharing this. And I should end briefly by saying that uh, uh, if you enjoyed this, you might also like uh, Nasia Anam uh, from the University of Nevada Reno will be giving a lecture on um, on the colony uh, as a site of critique uh, on May seventh. Uh, Hong Kong time, uh, 2 p.m. Um, let's do some maths if you live elsewhere. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Michael uh, and Nasia uh, and uh, and a few other brilliant people were all on this panel uh, thinking about locations of critique. And, and so this is a kind of, uh, this kind of Michael's was a, a commentary on elsewhere. Uh, and Nazi is as a commentary on on the colony and the, and the and the refugee camp, and so I think it'll be a, 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 an interesting way to continue this conversation. So if you can join, it's uh, May seventh, uh, two p.m. Hong Kong time. Um, but until then, thank you very much for uh, zooming in. Thank you, Michael. It was great. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank Take you care. very much, Daniel. I really appreciate it, and have a good day ahead of you. <laughs> thank you. See you. Take care. Thanks.